It is Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022, and we're here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're in Genesis chapter 22 tonight, so you may want to be getting a Bible ready. We'll have the text on the screen, and maybe that'll help those of you who are joining us on YouTube. Uh, but there's also a value in having it open in our own laps and a hard copy or on our own device. So hope you'll be ready for that. Genesis 22, just a few moments. Uh, we're glad you joined us tonight. We want to also invite you to be with us this coming Lord's Day morning in person at 9.30 for a Bible study and at 10.30 for worship. And if you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, uh, feel free to send me an email message at fourlakeschurch at gmail.com or call or send a text to our church number, which is 608-224-0274, and we would certainly love to hear from you. Uh, tonight, we are back to the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings, written primarily by Moses. We've been studying the life of Abraham over the past couple months. And last week, we came to the birth of Isaac. So Isaac is born. Sarah pretty much kicks Hagar and Ishmael out of the house, and we dealt with that last Wednesday evening. But of course, God makes sure that they're taken care of out in the wilderness. So that brings us up to Genesis chapter 22 tonight. So our first paragraph is Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 8. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 8. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. We don't have too much of a timeline on this other than this happening after these things. I know some have suggested that Isaac was very roughly 12 years old at this point, at least old enough to uh, walk on his own and carry wood and carry on a conversation, but not really old enough to completely uh, rebel and just run away completely to where he can live and survive on his own. So somewhere in that range, the age of 12, give or take a little bit. But we find in the opening verses of this chapter that God speaks to Abraham again. And Abraham responds, here I am. And this time God wants Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, as a burnt offering. And we should note that this is described as a test. So God knows that Abraham is faithful, but he wants proof of this, we might say. Uh, this is not a temptation to sin. This is to be a demonstration. So there is a difference between a temptation and a test. And I should also point out that a test isn't just for the teacher's benefit, is it? It's not just so the teacher has a grade for us. Uh, but the test can also be for our benefit. Often we get stronger as a result of studying for a test and even through taking a test. Uh, we prove something to ourselves. And that may be a factor here as well. That's at least something we need to keep in mind. If you remember, Abraham has had some stumbles through the years. And they've tried to find some shortcuts around God's plan for their lives. And so now he has a chance to prove himself here. We should also point out that what happens here will also be something of a preview of what is coming with Jesus. And I say this because in this command, I hope we notice the emphasis on Isaac being Abraham's only son. And it's repeated in a few different ways. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And uh, and so on. So God uh, could have just said Isaac, obviously, just take Isaac. But uh, he emphasizes the fact here that Isaac is Abraham's only son, the son whom he loves. If we've been reading Genesis up to this point, we know this already, obviously, but uh, God repeats it here for emphasis. And also, similar to God telling Abraham to leave Ur many years ago and that he would tell him where he's going once he's on the way, 
Uh, so also, God does not reveal the destination here until he has started the journey. In other words, you are to get going, and then you are to offer Isaac as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Well, a number of people through the years have identified this as being the location of the temple many years later. Uh, this isn't nailed down in the text, but it is possible, and there are some things that would suggest this. Uh, Abraham was to go to the land of Moriah, to a mountain God would identify. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, we're told that Solomon builds his temple on Mount Moriah. And it's an interesting connection to think that the temple would perhaps later be built on the spot where Isaac was sacrificed. And then also that means uh, Isaac would be sacrificed in the city where Jesus would be crucified. So kind of some interesting connections there. Well, in verse 3, we get to another reference to Abraham rising early in the morning. There are uh, three of these references in Genesis. Once in chapter 19 with reference to Abraham getting up early to survey the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then we had a second reference in Genesis chapter 21. This is something we looked at last week. You might remember Abraham gets up early to send Hagar and Ishmael off into the wilderness. And now we have this reference here. So Abraham obviously has a habit of getting up early in the morning. I think we might say that, uh, as has been said many times in the past, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing well. It's worth getting an early start on it. And this is uh, something Abraham is doing, obviously, because God had commanded it. And uh, it just would have been, I would imagine, a, a terrible night before thinking through this. Uh, if God had uh, commanded us to sacrifice our only child, obviously, we may be a little bit slow uh, to obey that command. But Abraham, in faith, he gets up early and he gets started. We find here that Abraham takes two young men with him on his journey. Uh, servants, we can probably safely assume, maybe just members of the household, uh, young men who are going to help him out uh, getting where he needs to go. Uh, Abraham splits wood and he heads out as, uh, as, as far as he can. He kind of makes some progress here. I think this uh, said it was a three-day journey. Um, as far as I can tell, this is the only reference to splitting wood in the Bible. And I kind of find that interesting. Genesis is a book of first, a book of beginnings. And so uh, the first reference to anybody splitting wood, and he splits the wood and he heads out. Um, I split wood this past week on Monday for a campfire out in the front yard as I waited for the trick-or-treaters who never showed up at our house. Uh, most of you know that we heat our house with wood. We heated with wood down in Janesville as well. We had a wood stove when I was growing up down in the Chicago suburbs. So I've uh, uh, split wood much of my life. I've split a lot of wood here and there through the years uh, with a wedge and a sledgehammer, uh, kind of the way I guess I learned many years ago. Uh, with a splitting maul, I kind of um, advanced to that uh, when we moved here to Madison, a big mall, very heavy kind of a triangle wedge shape there. And uh, in fairly recent years, I've kind of moved over to the Fireside Friend, a little tool made by Estwing. And uh, if you look up Fireside Friend on Farm and Fleet's website, you'll find my review of that fine tool. It is a, a beautiful piece of work. The last time I checked, there were only two reviews on Farm and Fleet's website for this, and uh, one of those is mine. There could be more reviews now, I don't know, but I've given several of these as gifts through the years. Some of you listening tonight might have received one of these from me. Um, I doubt Abraham had one of these, obviously, but I just find it interesting that we have a, a reference here to the father of the faithful, and he is out there splitting wood. It's one of those jobs that just needs to be done from time to time. To get a fire started, you often need uh, wood to go from big down to something small, something that's a little more burnable. Well, in verse 5, once he uh, sees the place out in the distance, he tells the young man to stay with the donkey, and then he makes a very interesting statement here. I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. And if we were together tonight, I would ask, what does that tell us? What was, what was Abraham thinking here? What's going through his mind? I mean, there's the chance that he's lying so that the young man don't try to stop him from doing this. I mean, if he had said, I'm heading over there to sacrifice Isaac, I'll be back in a little bit. They might have had an issue with that. I don't know. Uh, but I'm thinking that Abraham was fully confident that both he and Isaac would truly return. I think that's what's going on here, uh, that they together would come back 
uh, together after this. So uh, I, we will go over there and we will return after we're done worshiping. So I just kind of find that interesting. Um, in fact, the author of Hebrews addresses this over in Hebrews chapter 11, the uh, hall of fame of God's faithful. And I don't think I'm spoiling this for those of you who are watching here tonight. We all know what happens next in this chapter. Uh, but in Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, the Bible says that by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Well, just following the reasoning here, God promised Abraham that he would have descendants through Isaac. And if God is telling him to sacrifice Isaac, and if Isaac has not yet had children, then obviously in Abraham's mind, God would be raising Isaac from the dead. That's how much faith Abraham had, even though nobody had yet been raised from the dead up to this point in world history as far as we know. Uh, Abraham pretty much invented the concept as the only way through this situation. And the author of Hebrews makes the point that Abraham received Isaac back as a type. So obviously, um, we aren't there yet in this story, but Isaac coming back from the dead, in a sense, will foreshadow Jesus coming back from the dead. And I'm mentioning all of this here simply because Abraham in verse 5 seems extremely confident that both he and Isaac will come back from whatever it is that they are about to do, even though Abraham knows that he's been commanded to sacrifice Isaac. By the way, in verse 5, we have the first use of the word worship anywhere in the Bible. Uh, people have worshipped before. Sacrifices were offered previously, but I'm just saying this is the first time that the word worship is used. So again, Genesis being a book of beginnings, a book of firsts, and this is one of those. The word worship is used, I think, well over 100 times in the Bible, and it goes back to a word that refers to bowing down. And uh, this is simply the first use of it. Uh, let's remember here that Abraham is really old at this point, right? He was uh, 100 when Isaac was born. And as I said earlier, this is perhaps around 12 years later. So roughly at the age of 112, Abraham lets his son carry his own firewood. And Abraham carries the fire and the knife. So the fire may be a reference to a coal of some kind that was packaged in a way that, that, that it would travel for uh, several days. It may be a reference to uh, flint, rock, something that was used to create sparks. Um, I don't know, but they carry the fire and the knife. And along the way, notice we find the wheels are turning in Isaac's mind, aren't they? And he ultimately, he wants to know, uh, we've got the fire in the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And that, that tells us right away that I think Abraham has raised Isaac to know that sacrifices involve a lamb. And so he's been trained, he knows, and he's old enough to realize that something is missing here. And in response, Abraham says that God will provide. And, uh, you know, this is a little bit different from Abraham's first theory that he would raise Isaac from the dead. So now Abraham is thinking that maybe God will provide a lamb somehow. And so they continue walking along together, which must have been... Um, ever so slightly awkward. I think after just this whole trip is kind of strange, especially for these two men, uh, which leads to a rare meme in our studies. I rarely ever share memes in our Wednesday night classes. So uh, for those of you joining us on the phone who can't see this, uh, the text has Abraham saying, come on, Isaac, God commanded us to make a sacrifice. Isaac notices that there are no goats or sheep anywhere nearby, and then we have that very um, awkward look, I think we might say, for those of us who are who are seeing this. So I hope you'll forgive me for sharing this tonight, and uh, I hope to have one more meme in a few min minutes. So uh, two in one night, hope to not overdo it or anything, but we'll come back to another one in just a moment. But certainly an awkward uh, conversation, an awkward uh, trip on these three days heading for uh, sacrifice with no sacrifice. So let's continue on with Genesis 22, verses 9 through 14. Genesis 22, verses 9 through 14. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. 
And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad, and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it will be provided. I think we can hardly imagine doing something like this, but Abraham obeys. He builds this altar, he arranges the wood, and I'm guessing at the very last possible moment, he ties up Isaac, his son, and he puts him on top of the wood. Abraham actually takes the knife, and as I understand the text here, he actually has his hand raised. He is ready to sacrifice his son, doing what God has commanded him to do. But at the last moment, an angel steps in and calls out and stops Abraham from doing what he's about to do. And the message from God through this angel is that now he, God, knows that Abraham fears God. And to me, it seems that God already knew this in some sense. And we're going to find that out in a couple chapters here, that God knew it all along. But now Abraham has demonstrated his fear of God. So once again, I hope we notice the emphasis on Isaac being Abraham's son, his only son. Not literally the only son he's ever had, but this is the only son of promise. This is his only son with Sarah, his wife. In the last section here, God does provide the sacrifice. Abraham looks behind him. He sees this ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham offers the ram as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And this is where we're introduced to the idea of one sacrifice being offered in the place of another. So this is another first in the book of Genesis. Uh, In a sense, this is what Jesus has done for us, correct? He has offered himself in our place. We deserve death for what we've done, but the Lord Jesus has taken our place on the cross. And so that's that reference to uh, what happens here with Isaac being a type of, of what will go on to uh, happen later. Well, Abraham then renames the place the Lord will provide, uh, since is the, this is the place where the Lord provided the sacrifice. And I hope you're ready for our second meme tonight, okay? Just brace for it here. Um, and again, for those of you joining us on the phone tonight, we've got a young man looking, I'd say, a little bit uh, suspicious, kind of a combination of uh, <laughs> suspicious, terrified, and disappointed. And the caption, Isaac looking at Abraham like this on the way back home after he tried to sacrifice him. And again, uh, might have also been a very awkward uh, awkward walk back home. I mean, this was a, a learning experience for God in a sense. It was a learning experience for Abraham. Uh, but certainly this had an impact <laughs> on Isaac as well. I mean, you never look at your dad again uh, the same way after he tied you up, put you on a stack of wood ready to uh, cut your throat. Um, So certainly this would have had a big impact on Isaac. So let's uh, continue tonight with Genesis 22, 15 through 19. Genesis 22, verses 15 through 19. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens And as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. At some point before they rejoin the young men, this angel of the Lord calls from heaven a second time and now speaks on God's behalf, basically renewing the promise yet again. I'm kind of losing count. It's been renewed so many times. Because Abraham has obeyed, God will bless his descendants. And one new addition, I think, in this promise, something we haven't really seen before, if I remember this correctly, is that Abraham's descendants, notice in verse 17, will possess the gate of their enemies. To me, that seems like new information. But the the idea there being that Abraham's descendants will dominate, they will win, they will be victorious in battle, perhaps. Uh, The city gate was the place where, as we've talked before, the old guys would solve all the world's problems. And obviously the city gate was critical in defending a city, and so Abraham's descendants would own the gates of their enemies. Um, After this message from the angel, Abraham and Isaac returned to the young man as promised, and they all head out back to Beersheba. 
So let's conclude tonight with Genesis 22, verses 20 through 24. Genesis 22, 20 through 24. Now it came about after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, who has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, and Buz his brother, and Kimuel the father of Aram, and Chesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Rumah, also bore Teba and Geham, and Tehash, and Makkah. So basically, we just have a brief update on the family tree. So Abraham's brother Nahor has uh, some children. And among several others, his brother's youngest son had a daughter, Rebekah. So that's obviously going to be significant a little bit later. We'll get back to that in a couple weeks. Um, so this brings us to the end of Genesis 22. And next week, we hope to come together to look at chapter 23 and the death of Sarah. Uh, in terms of what this chapter means for us today, I, I think, first of all, we have something of a preview of the sacrifice of Jesus. That's a significant thing to notice in this chapter. So we've got the reminder to be thankful for that. And we are a direct recipients of this blessing on Abraham's descendants through the cross. So that's the first thing. But secondly, just as God tested Abraham, we should probably ask, how might God be testing us? I mean, obviously, he's not speaking to us. Uh, he's not asking us to sacrifice our children on an altar, nothing like that. But what do we have in our lives right now that we might consider more important than God? And are we willing to put God first before ourselves? before our families, before the stuff that we own, before anything else that might be important to us, you know, hobbies or work or anything, you know, you know, if God is testing us in a sense in this life, are we willing to put him first before absolutely everything? And this is what Jesus says over in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 39, keeping this in mind, remembering what Abraham was willing to do. Matthew 10, 32 through 39, Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Just as Abraham uh, put God first, even before the life of his son. Uh, so also we must put God first. We may not realize it, but we are being tested tonight. So with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930. We're getting back to our study of Isaiah. And then after class on Sunday, we plan on coming together again at 1030 for our worship assembly. Don't forget the soup, slurp, and sing this coming Sunday right after worship. So this has been in the bulletin for several weeks now. If you have any questions, talk to Gary Mueller about that. But right after worship, we plan on heading right up the road, right up Highway 151. There's some back ways too uh, to get to Sun Prairie. So Patsy lives uh, a few blocks south of the Walmart in Sun Prairie. Very easy to find. There's a community room at her apartment building. Uh, apparently they've redone it lately. So it may not look the same as we saw it a few years ago. It's been a while because of COVID since we've been able to get together like this. But uh, we plan on uh, slurping soup and then doing some singing together. So soup, slurp, and sing. We've done this at the Mueller's house before. We've done this at uh, County Park before. We've done this at Patsy's Place before. So we're getting together at Patsy's Place after worship this coming Sunday. And uh, I am looking forward to that. Hope to see you there. Let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You gave your one and only, only begotten Son for us. He suffered, he died in our place, and we are so thankful for that sacrifice. We pray that as we face temptations, we would make choices that 
honor you in everything that we say or do or even think. We know from scripture that you have promised a way of escape out of every situation where we may be tempted to sin. And tonight we pray earnestly that we would find the wisdom to find that way of escape and that you would give us the courage to take it. We come to you tonight, Father, through your son, Jesus. Amen.